Hello there everyone and welcome back to Tino the Lessons of Europe, which we're playing as the African Savior Hans Daddy Hutig, but we gotta talk about exploring the interior. Captain Marcus Weidman vomited into the underbrush, narrowly avoiding getting it all over his uniform. When he had received his new orders, desperately hoping for a transfer to Quillamane, he had instead found himself sent from his border garrison to the stinking crap hole mine at the edge of West Africa. To any demoralized reprovets to watch over hundreds of involuntary workers responsible for keeping the titanium flowing, it was no wonder he spent most of his days in inebriated haze. Weidman wondered why he endured and why he didn't just pull out the Luger and had to pull it in his brain. After days filled to the brim with all the savagery and depravity the world had to offer, he was forced to rel relive it all again in his dreams, feeling as though he spent every second in a waking dream. Weidman had begun to wonder if he was going to go mad. And so it was that. Staggering back to camp with the vomit on his boots, Weidman was the first to see the men coming out of the trees. Suddenly, death didn't seem so favorable. As men shouted in the unfamiliar language, Weidman turned to run into the bushes, despite understanding in a sudden burst of clarity that he could not escape, that these were his final seconds on earth. Boots crunching in the hummus. He was suddenly reminded of the crunching of his boots in the snow as a boy in his native Turingia. He felt himself drawn into a memory, tripping and falling in the snow, blooding his nose against a rock for a moment. He smelled the tweed of his father's coat as he was carried to bed. It was so long ago now. As the bullets dripped through him, roses of blood blooming on the front of his uniform, Captain Weidman fell heavily into the dankness of the forest floor. As his empty eyes stared up at the endless void between the stars, he was claimed by a more profound darkness. Did, his, did he live his life again in every detail during that surprise or supreme moment of complete knowledge? We lose some manpower, which sucks, but hey, we got more money. Look at that. 9.4. Oh. Pay debt. 6.9. Nice. We've got some comments to go through as well. And we're currently doing... A very laggy focus. No. No, just help me help you focus. Booby trap the interior or booby trap the border. Yes. With the war looming closer every single day, we need other we need to actively prepare for the worst. While the other Rex Commissars, it feels an insult to the office who took represents to call even them as such. I've done nothing, we are prepared, of course. In order to slow the enemy advance until we can fully mobilize our scattered forces and inflict as many losses to the enemy without any on our part, we shall disseminate the border with dozens of large minefields and wire trap most bridges and railroads the enemy might use against us. With the border effectively booby trapped, the OFN will think twice before entering our realm. Oh, the surprises we have in store for them. We can test some gas. Uh, rebel sympathies in Sudwest African as us. Also, I did forget, but we can, like, we literally have to manually add in all the evidence that we have. So we have everything we need for Muller. We need all, everything for Shank, though, now, which we have nothing, which does suck. Uh, war preparations are not bad. Uh, and then we have resources from Germany, which... We're still looking okay, except for consumer goods, which is not really an issue for us, so... Thank you. Uh, cl agents classified. I've returned for the operations in... Ojiwarongo, and the results are promising. Agent Classified have been tasked with observing a base that belonged to an unnamed native warlord and his force. During the scouting operation, the operative noticed an event which left them troubled, and we can agree with that assessment. Midway into the stakeout, the agent noticed a strange visitor, an African SS member. Sudwest Africa only has a small number of native often SS soldiers, much less other than Rex Commissariats. The operative says the SS member had the insignia of a Unterstumpfer. It is our belief that this individual came from the Leuven Division, the only SS regiment of the Sudwest African Army. After consulting with a warlord for a short period of time, the SS man shook hands and left the compound unharmed, with no further action taken. Initially, the SS believed the meeting to be a part of negotiations for the warlord's eventual departure, but the rebels did not move over the next couple of days, and the base was never attacked or otherwise disturbed. Terror sympathies in the ranks of the SS. It's a complete disaster. And must be corrected at once. The Rex Commissar Wolfgang Schenk, as commander of the armed forces, is responsible for all this disaster. Unless there is a reason for this event, the entire Sudwest African SS must be purged immediately. For the glory of the Vaterland, the honor of the Aryan Knights must be reclaimed from the Untermensch. Absolutely. Positively. Economy. Help me help you. And booby trap the border. The Deutsche Rhodesian Balfons. Shielding his eyes from the harsh morning sun, James Cumberdale squinted down the drive with the cloud of dust drifting in the wake of his family's Volkswagen as his wife took Godfrey to school in Fort Victoria. Sipping tea on the balcony of the plantation, a state that he had been his father's and had been his father's before him, James enjoyed the warmth of the rising sun, loosening his rheumatic joints as he gazed over the fields of swaying hemp, stretching as far as the eye could see. Soon it would be time to wake the slaves. Finishing his tea, James stepped indoors into the drawing room to reread the telegram he had received the prior afternoon. Try as he might, he couldn't find the hidden catch. According to the official telegram, the Reichs Commissar approved the provision of additional funds for British planters to exploit undeveloped land for their mutual prosperity. The Deutsche Rhodesian Balfons, they called it. If James hastily learned Germany served him right, that translated as German Rhodesian Building Fund. James sunk into his most comfortable chair, spreading himself around until he felt comfortable. Then he read it again. Life under the Nazis hadn't been what he had 
had is, hasn't been as bad as he had been expecting, for the most part. They left the British colonists and their new rocks to come alone, but there's always been an underlying tension between the British and their new German overlords, and yet, as of late, they had only been conciliatory. conciliatory. First, they permitted English language radio broadcasts. Then they granted British planters a vast tracts of land in exchange for a meaningless pledge of loyalty he happily given. <clears throat> they had even given him a free TV set where Godfrey liked to plant himself on the weekends when he should have been doing his Aryan biology homework. The likes of never did anything out of his goodness of his heart, so what exactly did he expect to get out of this? Slipping the telegram, or slipping it back into a suit pocket. James stepped back outside to watch the overseers and herd slaves into the fields. In his grandfather's time, all the sun had been untamed. If these funds came through, perhaps they'd give him the chance to stamp his own mark on Africa. This has also been one of the dark places of the Earth. Oh, this actually went back up, huh? 10.7%, that sucks. But it happens. Now, 100 for 1 is not bad. I do want to wait to do this one. Uh, 28 days. That's more. That's nice to get more political power, actually. That'd be actually really, really good. More stability would be nice, but it doesn't really matter too much. Uh, we'll talk about this in just a little bit as well. But right now, we're going to go with arms for Aryans. With the war looming, we need to enact all of our contingency plans. Our reserves shall be fully mobilized, and all of our armies will be produced at, will produce a full capacity. No matter the cost of slaves, still, our industrial capacity is limited. And we need to ask for help from our government in Germania. While we wait for the supplies, we should implement harsher training regimens and increase emergency measures, so that we won't be caught unprepared by a sudden attack to our vulnerable areas. Sounds like a smart thing to do. As not... Oh. Good to get attacked. And also, I didn't see this earlier, but... Actually, I did, but... We went from fair credit rating to an acceptable credit rating. We're doing better here. 100%... 150% of debt ceiling is possible for us now, which is okay. I just wish we went... Could go a little higher here, but whatever, you know. It is what it is. Ah, uh, just conscript a few more workers. Reduce rations for workers, too. Ah. <sighs> we just need more surplus. Booby trap them? Yes, please. Passive defense schemes. The Reichskommissar sat on the balcony of his palace, watching the slaves meander through this still, his still tenebrous gardens as the freshness of twilight chilled the sweat moistening his heavy woolen uniform. Taking a moment to look up from the map sprawled over the table, he felt a thrill of quite accomplishment run through him as he gazed upon the orderliness of his design. Soon, all of us Africa will be re uh, remade in, in its image, ordered, disciplined, efficient, and everything and everyone in their proper place. Until the dawn of that golden future, however, there was still work to be done. Tearing himself away from the view, Hutu focused his attention back to the pile of maps, already darkening as the light faded. He would have to order a slave to bring him a lantern. He was enjoying the evening serenity too much to return to his office. With a single ivory finger, he traced the border between Ost Africa and South Africa, the border that when its carefully laid plans come to fruition would be soon to cease, or cease to exist. Nevertheless, although his troops were better disciplined, trained, and equipped than the South African rabble, he was not foolish enough to think a victory of certainty until the flag of the Reich was raised over Cape Town. Until then, he devised contingency after contingency, should the unthinkable come to pass and the enemy push into Ost Africa. In the case that ludicrous plausibility came to pass, he had ordered the entire border mined and ridden with traps to cut down the advancing forces of the enemy. Nowhere was left open for the degenerates to enter Ost Africa unscathed, with their forces getting blown apart like sausages in a pan for every step they took. Their forces would get slowed sufficiently for Hutu's crack troops to rush and to crush her advance and push them to the sea. Who took turn his head to look into the distant, her dusky horizon? Any day now that degenerates and subhumans could come, he could almost see the simian horde crossing over the hills. When they came, they'd find him waiting for them. The stillness of the of life did not in the least resemble a peace. Now we can test a gas. Less stability, less command power. More stability, war support, more construction speed. Oh. It's clear that a conflict is coming. We'll be ready and so will be our weapons. Our chemical stockpile will be tested and modern as necessary. Is that good? Production used to GDP ratio modifier? We'll, uh, we'll test it right now. We went to 5 now. Which is... Eh, not great. Hey, not bad though. 10.7%. Ah, over consuming fuel. Agents classified return from the, uh, for the operation in Nami Bay, and the results are promising. Posing as an accountant from the Reich, our operative gained access to the HQ of the oil extraction and production operations that go on in Lubango, the largest oil producing state in Sudan, Africa. For simplicity's sake, the data was copied and transferred to our HQ where it was analyzed. Agent Classify was able to send us copies of several reports specifically, ones that dealt with Sudan's African oil consumption. When investigated, a certain percent, a, a certain particularly cut. Our peculiarity caught our attention. Sudan's Africa takes a certain percentage of fuel extracted for themselves in order to supply their industry and our forces. This number is supposed to cover only their expended fuel and nothing more. However, the number that we discovered has revealed that they are taking far more than they need. Our estimates have that, that the entire airports and army could be on full operations and they would not be consuming the fuel they use currently. Something is clearly missed at worst. This could lead to a charge of conspiracy to defraud the Reich, which carries a variable sentence between five years and death, depending on the severity, as well as compensation and damages, as outlined by Section 212 of the Strauss-Gazette book. Strauss book. It could be, however, unlikely that Subas Africa has a system of fuel tanks online and is filling them, with the knowledge and consent of Germania, or they have sources of fuel expenditure. They do not know about. We will continue to research this discrepancy and inform you upper findings for the glory of the borderland. Mosquitoes and leeches always leave their marks. Promote loyalists would be nice, but we don't need that right now. 
Evidence. Uh, oil, yes. Send the evidence. We could! Our investigation stands at $13 million. We only need two more pieces of evidence. Evidence. Two more, two more. And I'm not going to do throw stuff, so. I kind of want more money, too, but yeah. Thank you, credit ring improvement. Very, very nice. Death of some guy. That sucks for you, bro. Oh, booby trap at the border. A war's coming. That at times, the best offense is a good defense. Lay early traps across Romostadt. Uh, but it depends how fast and hard they push in, because I don't want to put anything in there. I don't, we gotta save our PP. Building a stockpile wouldn't be bad. Ooh, need to consume goods that goes down as well. Ooh. That part of Africa, or Russia's killing itself. Chemicals for guns. Ooh. A uh, hundred for one. It's clear the most important issue with local descent is crushing numerical inferiority. I think I read this one earlier, but we can't help to keep everything under control with our limited garrison, no matter their level of training, equipment, or sheer loyalty to the regime. We are perhaps literally outnumbered to 100 to 1. We need additional manpower, and the best way to achieve this task is to enlist the help of those non Aryans who have every reason to stay loyal to us, or else risk losing everything to a local uprising. No independence for you, huh? I just hope we can hold the border. That's what I want. Arms for Aryans, yes please. More prisons, yes please. Training in Quillamane. Flicking a switch, the drill sergeant kicked, killed the lights. For a moment, the only sound through the ceiling fan whipping the fetid tropical air around the room and he gathered soldiers shifting in their seats. Another flick, the whirling of the film projector, an image appeared on the wall accompanied by a boisterous military music. Africa, your duty. The title card cut to a montage and shots of natives starving, loitering, training with the shoddy weapons. Invariably, they were shot at a distance or from a high angle. The African subhumans began an authoritative voiceover, seen in their natural state of barbarity. To a German, the depravity of the native Africans may seem shocking, even unbelievable. Before the arrival of the Aryan to Africa, the subhumans of this land existed in a state of animalistic savagery, lower than all others on earth. Lower th even than the Jew. Wow. Shots of mud huts, sparse fields, men with spears. The film abruptly cut to a classic. Low angle shots of blonde haired German soldiers, so handsome. Lines of tanks rolling down the streets of Quillamane, ripping flags and so on. It was a slavishly amateur imitation of Riefenstahl's style, but that message was clear. You were part of the Aryan vanguard. The force bringing civilization and the values of national daddyism to the untamed shores of Africa. We will civilize this land. We will cleanse the tainted degeneracy and decadence from its people. As the subhumans will often not to accept the rightful place in our purified new order, it is your duty to enforce the edicts of the Reich in these, our newest and wildest territories. Shots of Germans with machetes cutting through the jungle launching mortars. You are trailblazers, entrusted with carrying forth the sacred flame of Aryanism, and so it continued on and on in much the same vein for two full hours. The soldiers, desperately trying not to appear bored in front of the drill sergeants, started, stared rapt at the flickering image. At last, the film ended. The projector clattering to a stop, plunging the room once more into darkness. Your strength is just an accident, arising from the weakness of others. Here we the Anglos. Let's get more political power. The Boogeyman. Dupont has approached us with an interesting proposal. He suggests finding a common threat that goes beyond the vague slave revolt for this. He has identified a group of four former South African politicians and authors who so plot with the OFN to destabilize the Rex Commissariat. In order to further unite our races and help relieve some pressure from our home front, we shall divulge confidential information that these men have contacts with the CIA and plan a full-scale uprising, while the slaves will receive further support and supplies and begin a second revolt as soon as our troops have been sent to deal with the first. This should help unite the population against both natives and reformers. Let's hope so. And we have a cup of coffee to keep us nice and warm. One of the comments from yesterday as well was, uh, so the Addis... Uh, Audio Africa Addis Africa Audio submod that we are using for this campaign. Looks like a patrol, it's not bad. Um, this submod allows the Reichstadt, the Gross Afrikanische Reichstadt, to survive and prevent the collapse. So I didn't know that. That's more detailed. That's from one of the comments. So thank you for letting me know. Uh, that just makes me more excited for this. So um, yeah, that'll be that'll be a lot of fun. It'll be a lot of fun when we can do that. Come on, let me just inf investigate. Agent force to cease. Oh, surveillance. Oh crap. Uh, a return for the operations of Africa with less than satisfactory results. Agent Classify was out of conducting field surveillance in the hopes that evidence of collaboration or leniency between the rebel groups in Sudwest Africa and the authorities could be uncovered. Unfortunately, the territory they were in was far more patrolled than initially thought. Agent Classified attempted to set up an observation position on more than one occasion, but nearby patrols forced them to change location eventually. The operative concluded the surveillance operation was impossible to accomplish and they vacated the area with little to no actionable intelligence uncovered. The operative insisted the frequency and intensity of the patrols had made it hard to accomplish surveillance without being uncovered and possibly captured. Given the delicate circumstances of the situation, it's understandable that the exposure and possible capture of one of our agents would cause enormous problems. And the working theory that the rebel groups and <clears throat> the local authority have been collaborating is true a massive breach like that would risk the exposure of the entire investigation and all of our assets. We cannot discount the possibility that the rebels had advanced knowledge that they would be spied upon. An investigation or intelligence network for any possible leaks is underway. Meanwhile, Agent Classify will be temporarily kept away from the public while they and their friends and relatives are investigated as well. No matter how dark is their night, the day will always come, which sucks, which I think I read last time, but oh well. Retribution. 
feeling a slightly tipsy from the three glasses of cognac he had down with a simple lunch of sausage and dumplings, regarded by him as a Spartan meal, showcasing to all his impeccable discipline, who took circled a few dis uh, figures on the document he was reading. Reports on the build-up of rebel groups in the interior was nothing compared to the Ost African racial census. It was one of the most frightening things he had ever read. According to this, the only census conducted since the establishment of the Rex Commissariat, Aryans were still a mi minuscule minority in Ost Africa even after the settlement programs. Though the racial purity of the Aryan cl clearly made them superior to the subhumans, the natives clearly had an advantage in numbers. Of course, he'd always known there were more natives in Af than Aryans in Af Africa, but that vague hypothetical was very different to seeing it written down in black and white. Chewing his pen, Hutek stared down at the figures and, after a long time, spent uh, a circle of the number of Aryans. Sighing, he began to type up a missive ordering the conscription of all Aryan males in the event of hostilities breaking out, which of course they almost certainly would. Although the Germans who had emigrated to Ost Africa seeking their fortunes of what they had were promised was bountiful virgin land had been promised that they would be exempt from being drafted. These were desperate times. If they didn't pitch in and do their part to protect Ost Africa from the savages, they would lose their homes, families, and very lives to the slavering horde. Surely performing their duty to the Reich and the national daddyism was a small price to pay for safety? Even if it wasn't, it wasn't like they had a choice in the matter. Leaning back in his new chair, who took smirk at the thought? All their ends should be willing to serve the Reich if needed, even if they needed a little push to do so. Ripping the complete dr completed draft from his typewriter, who took yell for more cognac? Mm, sure, why not? He has to live in the midst of incomprehensible, which is detectable, or detestable. The boogeyman. Reinforce the Anglos. More stability. The Anglos now under our rule have proved loyal enough, and in the light of our lack of resources to keep a military watch over all of our new possessions, we shall switch to a lighter approach. Lifford Dupont, a prominent Anglo leader with views very much in line with ours, will be appointed Colonial Valvalta de San Bessi. Well, mostly a ceremonial office, as he and his government will be under our complete control and surveillance, he will take up the task of keeping Rhodesia and Zambia under control using Anglo manpower, sparing us some, di some divisions we can use to maintain control over our main holdings in West Africa. Smart. Coffee. Yum. I do apologize for speaking very quickly. Um, I don't know. It is what it is. I'm pretty smooth with it. Reduce patrols. Why would we reduce patrols? No thanks. Oh, that's actually good. Keep working on our land auction for now. Um, yeah. That's good. How's the economy doing? Because we're just waiting for Germany kind of to cost 4.02. Before our conference ends. Not bad. So, for surplus, which is pretty good. 4% of GDP. Cool. Very cool. Uh, yeah. Is that the only one? Yeah. We only have two here, which sucks. Wait, what? Let's get shrink. Oh, we, we took it away. Okay. So we have one. We've got two. That's it. Oh, we can set it now. I wanted, I wanted to max it out, but I don't think we'll actually be able to. Let's see what happens to that one, though. We got a political power, though, which is good, 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 good. The list of our enemies. Enemies everywhere. Who took it feel their knives hovering behind his back, ready to strike? He gets sense of traitors hiding around the corner, ready to open the gates to the degenerates and the barbarians. They would destroy everything he had worked so hard to build. It cannot be allowed to happen, of course. Taking a deep breath, Hutik waited with uh, a lot of lag, but... Okay, that... There we go. Uh, uh, unusual serenity for Bea to finish scribbling. Chimelsky and others were quietly, quietly chatting amongst themselves about a strike that he had hit one of his new supply depots on the border the day before. Apparently, after slaughtering the garrison like savages, the rebel group that had done it just left their dead to molder in the dirt. They were suddenly making the list. It is complete, Rex Komasar said Bea, jolting Hutek from his reverie. Wordlessly, Hutek snatched the list from Bea's pudgy hand and glanced over it, scowling at the names of the groups and individuals who threatened his rule. This was to be made public, a propaganda piece to show Ost Africans, the men who threatened their homes and families, whose treasonous barbarous scum who would stand opposed to the Aryan future. Of course, they'd have to be removed. They'd have to remove a few names from the list for the one they sent to their Boer allies. It wouldn't do for them to learn how many of them would someday face the pointed end of a bullet. Very well, Bear, I approve. Thank you, gentlemen. You are dismissed. As his underlings filed out of the room, Hutuk rose and made his way to the balcony. It was a cool, refreshing evening, the sun just sinking below the horizon. Hutuk poured himself a glass of cognac as he looked out to the hazy, distant skyline of Quillamane, smog covering the city like a shroud. Hutuk looked down to the tenebrous venger of his gardens, utterly pristine and pure. So he's shambling through the gloom, maintaining the uh, immaculation of his design, everything and everyone in their proper place, inhaling the crisp air of dusk. Hutig awaited the dying of the light. We live as we dream alone. Now, this sucks that we... We live this one again. And we didn't do it again. So I'm going to go back in time and see if I can actually get, like, one or two of these to actually function correctly. So we can get at least three pieces of evidence. Because we just wasted so much political power there. But kick the hornet's nest. Massive desert. So I did ask you guys yesterday. Whether we should do jungle or desert. And at the time of this recording, there's a little bit more support for... 
the jungle. So, since jungle covers most of all of our four Africana uh, Rocks Commissariats, and several insurgencies has forced us to fight in this unfavorable terrain, it is imperative that we master jungle warfare repairs inside it. In the event of an enemy attack on our home soil, this would help us in fending off their uh, offensive and chasing them back across the border. As surely they don't have our same skill in rough terrain warfare. Cliff Dupont, Colonia Velvata de Sambi. Sam Bessie. Sipping at his wine, James Cumberdale savored its bold, earthy flavor. He'd finally been given an excuse to uncork his last remaining pre-war French vintage, an occasion he had been waiting for quite some time as his family had been afforded the honor of hosting Clifford Dupont, newly appointed Colonial of Alta, Colonial Administrator. He was able to puzzle out that using his shaky skills at German, Bosambia, and Zimbabwe. On a trip down south to Salisbury, realizing that he'd missed his guest com comet, he responded, Ah, oh, yes, quite. James, his wife, Majorie, and Dupont were seated at their opulent mahogany dining table in a pool of soft yellow light, enjoying a dinner of roast beef and gravy. Godfrey had been sent to the bed already, complaining uproariously as usual. Slaves stood by to refill glasses as Dupont held forth. Well, I suppose I had to accept it. Old Hans is quite the typical Hun, and I dare say that without my voice in his ear or <clears throat> chortling his translator's ear, things would have been a deal a much more hairier for us. Brunch down here. Of course, Dupont finished his wine and held it behind him where it was dutifully refilled. Wondering if there was some better way to approach the subject, James asked, Cliff, while you were in Quillamane, did you see an indication of the Rikes Commissar was building up the military? Yet seeing Dupont darken and put down his glass, he quickly added, It's just that a lot of us out here are worried about the instability that may ensue were there to be a conflict, more so than usual. Dupont sighed deeply and frowned upon James. I won't lie to you, there's a good chance it could get hot, especially out here. I'm um, doing all I can to talk him down, but Hans doesn't like much listening to anyone who isn't agreeing with him. Following that, the rest of the evening was decidedly subdued and all retired early. When dawn came, James stood with Godfrey on the plantation ve veranda, watching the slaves go to work in the endless fields of swamping hemp, swaying hemp, as Dupont's driver took him away down the driveway in a cloud of red dust, putting a hand on his son's shoulder. They looked out together into the uncertain future. We couldn't understand because we were too far, and couldn't remember because we were traveling the night of first ages. And reports to the best African position abandoned him. Agents classified have returned from their operation in Sumque. And the results are promising. Operative Classified was tasked with documenting the readiness of the Sudan African Army, what they found shocked them and arose to any belief that they had in Shanks' forces. The northern border of the South Africa is important for several reasons. One, it is frequently traversed by terrorist organizations such as Svavo, UNITA, and MPLA. Second, it is a border with a major geopolitical threat, thus high readiness is expected of all the forces there. So it was a shock when our asset found a base near the border a few, a few kilometers away from a major source of rebel activity completely and totally abandoned. The agent was able to walk through an unopened gate after they had confirmed that there were no soldiers on site. They were able to walk into empty empty bare halls, offices, and storage rooms, all of which looked like the soldiers inside packed up and left. There were still appliances and blankets stored there, as well as a few uniforms, but the whole facility was empty. If they had not brought the pack pictures, they, we would not be able to believe it. Dereliction of duty is a serious crime in the Reich, section C section 231 of the Strafgesetzbuch, and we have a horrifying example of it in front of us. The army that Schenk runs is simply not up to the job of defending the colonies of the Reich. A major purge of disordered, ineffective elements must take place, starting right at the top, for the glory of the Vaterland. An army is only as good as its leader. So we do now have, um, let's see, reduce patrols, conscript more workers. Uh, what, do we, what do we have here? Mm, Desert outposts. There. Now that's three, and we want one more. If possible, we could, we're going to try to get one more. If we can only get seven in total. Instead of like, you know, eight. So it'll be it. Introduce the rations for now. And of course, it's September 23rd. Hopefully, we can get it. But then again, there's probably going to be a slight civil war happening in Germania soon, too. So we'll see what happens. Gods of the North, of course. And we're currently doing Master of the Jungle. After this one, let's do building a stockpile, kicking the hornet's nest, prepare for the, prepare the wolves. Uh, building a stockpile. While we have enough weapons to equip our regular forces, the last war taught us that attrition is a constant and an increasingly large army will need much more equipment than we can currently produce. In order to ensure that we won't face shortages at a critical moment in the war, we need to stockpile all produce equipment and properly maintain everything currently in use, be it new or old. From a mighty panther to a single Luger pistol round, we will collect and preserve everything we might need. Everything. Every single thing. Everything. Oh. What happened there? Lessons from the Central Africanishin Wars. As soon as he pulled over the intricately detailed map of Central Africa unfurled on his desk, he was reminded of the Fuhrer's declaration long ago that Africa was too wild, primordial, and barbaric to be a suitable home for the Aryan race. After the war against the Bolsheviks and the Judeo capitalists, the Reich had seized Africa for her thousand year empire. But to Hutig's eternal irritation, Germania never seemed to share his burning zeal to develop into the prime Aryan Lebensraum. 
Though a frau, the Reichs Commissar circled all the locations of major German defeats and the seemingly endless border skirmishes between Central Africa and the Simian savages of Cameroon. Sitting down his pen, he settled his chin on, the hand, on his hand and took in the full image. The Reich's defeats appeared to be almost completely have taken place in the lush jungle terrain. What do you consider the problem? Müller was a buffoon with no clue how to lead his motley band of mercenaries and degenerates and spent more time hunting elephants from a helicopter than carrying out his duties. Schenk, of course, was a little better willing of the way the day tinkering with his planes like a little boy playing with toy soldiers, nevertheless. There seems to be an obvious pattern here. By observing Müller's failures, it was clear to Hutig that the Reich's defeats against the Cameroonian barbarians was not caused by deficient discipline and expertise among the men. Issues with supplies or equipment, or even poor guidance with that idiot leader, but it was a result of lack of training in the jungle combat. Yes, that was it. Germans were racially attuned to forests, meadows, mountains, not Africa's primordial steaming jungles. Hutig had no doubt his troops with little training could storm the battlefields of Africa. Allowing himself a thin smile, Hutig felt felt satisfied he had secured the future of national daddyism in Africa. Leaning back in his chair, his good mood was instantly wiped away as he was once again assaulted by the infernal crackling that made his teeth rattle like the scratching of a knife on a blackboard. All of that mysterious life of the wilderness that stirs in the jungles in the hearts of wild men. Oh, it's African autumn. Who dig? I never pondered a Reich without Adolf Hitler. The thought seemed traitorous, apocalyptic. Hitler was ill, confined to a bed in Germania, under the care of doctors more eager to entertain a spasmic rotation of would-be successors. Who dig? stomach felt like a stone and fat beads of sweat crawled over his Sebom slick brow. Hutuk felt cold, a cold so deep that the warmth of the African sun seemed somehow lesser and more bearable. Hutuk strode to his desk through the ranks of joining fans and took out a form and pen. Nothing would deter him. Hitler's vision for us Africa would be realized, but he just needed more proof to drive his men harder and prize their soul. The sole incontrovertible truth from Müller and Schenk's prolific fiefdoms. An ordered lettering. Hutuk wrote to lagging investigators and idle officers. Each man would be replaced with a new, more competent official, one who would hurry the investigation and produce fast results in future endeavors, or suffer a similar fate to his predecessor. Simultaneously, the results of the investigation would be hurried to the Reich immediately. The arms of a thin metal clock hammered out the hours, gliding from one o'clock to two and welcoming a black cloud pregnant with rainwater. Hutig set his pen down and walked to his balcony, even in a world without Hitler, without the man who led the Aryan race in war to become the masters of Europe, there will still be his rule. The indolent, the weak, all will be destroyed in the service of a great people and the magnificent German Reich. Africa will soon be scoured. Now, that got rid of the other stuff. Did he die already? I hope not. I really hope not. But, uh, oh, here we go. Rebels possess cutting edge we German weaponry. Agents classified returned from the operation at Ondijiva, and the results are promising. Agent classified was sent to conduct surveillance of a facility rumored to be a command center for the terrorist group Unita. For several days, they headed in a concealed location while they took note of various going ons around the facility. After successfully exfiltrating, our asset was able to give us many interesting bits of information from the reconnaissance, including a photograph. This photograph is interesting for many reasons, first of all. Despite being fairly well known as an area controlled by UNITO, the area has apparently not been interrupted or disturbed. Operative classifieds reports state that the local garrisons have apparently not visited the area recently, and the photograph shows evidence of a bombing campaign. This is obviously a huge failure by Shanks' highly vaunted Air Force. More concerning about the photograph is the equipment held by some of the UNITA, UNITA soldiers. Several soldiers are holding what appear to be the LAG G1 assault rifles. These are recent models introduced in 1958, however. Our observations reveal that at least once at least one of these rifle sided metal stock and handguard, making it possibly a GA, G1A1, introduced in 1960 or a 62 model G1A2. It seems the shipment of G, a G1A1 GA, and G1 rifles have been sent to Sweet Africa to outfit its army, but there's no report on why UNITA seems to have gotten them. The worst scenario is that UNITA and Schenk have entered into some sort of agreement where UNITA is giving weaponry and left alone in exchange for some sort of ceasefire. This could fall under Section 202 of the Strafe Gazette's book, providing aid and comfort to the enemy, punishable by life, imprisonment, or death. But until a link is proven, it remains speculative. We recommend that more surveillance of UNITA is carried out, as well as more investigation into the Suves African Armed Forces. For the glory of the Vaterland, rats always leave droplings. And I did ask you guys yesterday what you want to do. We'll talk about that in just a little bit, but kicking the horns nest. So South Africa is on the brink of full-scale anarchy. Between the Boer Revolt, the Anglo fears for military losses, and our native discontent, the risk of total collapse for the former Dominion grows every day, and we will aim to give this rotten, crumbling evidence, edifice the fatal blow. By assassinating a prominent politician in broad daylight, the country will descend even more in political chaos, as our political institutions squabble to save themselves from our ire. Response from Germania. Uh, like Skumasah We have received your report and stated it in full. The conclusions are interesting, if a bit implausible, and warrant further research. The allegations that you made were unthinkable and shocking, as I'm sure you are aware. These allegations were ones that would require a great deal of proof, suffice to say. The evidence you put forward was enough to consider. The allegations are serious and further investigations do need to be conducted. However, the Consulai has much more pressing concerns at the moment. Your case, though you do seem passionate about it, is extremely vague and not a high priority right now. We unfortunately have to put any further investigations off until a later date when we can fully commit ourselves to such an investigation. In the meantime, we order you to cease all further investigations until a full and proper one can be conducted. We'll contact you if there's a change which causes us to reevaluate the importance of your investigation. How Hitler, Philip Böhler, Chief de Consulai des Führers der NSDAP, we don't know the true danger that we're in. We need to prepare for when Germany will finally open his eyes, so... 
I replayed this just a little bit and got and I sent the sent the evidence button to t click that one um, with seven out of eight evidence in total. Obviously, the eighth one po popped or started when or it came up after we sent it in, but because we ran out of time, but it kind of sucked. Uh, I'm not really sure what else to say about that. It kind of that guy just has a massive forehead, but like it sucks that we can't get send eight out of eight. Maybe I just wasn't there in time. I don't know, but. It does kind of suck that that happened like that. So the fear has died. Go the main morning as every other mourned as every other city in the Reich did when they received news of the fear's passing. Flags flew at half mast. When men and women wept in the streets, marching bands pl paraded, playing a somber tune. Alex Commissar himself gave a speech to party members in the assembly. For one day, in the Reich's African jewel, all his sons and daughters paid homage to the man who returned Germany to replace in the sun. An operative word for a day. No more, no less. Quillemaine and Ost Africa return to normal morning, uh, to normal mor tomorrow morning. For the Aryan people are strong and only need we weep once before marching once more towards the future they are destined to inherit. Hans Dieter will see to that full well. Grief, but in moderation. In moderation. Which we did try to booby trap some of these areas, so we'll see. I don't think we'll lose that many places, but I could be very, very, very wrong. So just in case, looks like some places here are going to kind of explode just a wee bit, which is fine with us. Absolutely fine. Oh, look at that lag. Oh, that's lagging very hard. I just want to see if we have any upgrades, man. Oh, armor expert. I kind of like that one a lot. Get some increased tactics usage, yes. Uh, for the tankish sort of dudes. Go scavenger, because we will need more equipment anyways. And ambusher is not bad. I'm going to wait. Maybe we can do the ambusher. Maybe not. We'll see. Promote loyalists. Uh, we could use more war support, I suppose. We could try it. They just across Gaza. Oh, oh! Now there's like, now there's going to be a German civil war, my friends. Just a small one, a small civil war. L lay early traps across Vestung's Victoria. We could do that, but I want to keep our political power. We might need it later on. So it begins. Uh, promote loyalists. Uh, we could. We might already be maxed out, though. Maybe not, but maybe. Um. Hmm. Let's see if we can actually get any more. No, well, okay, that's what I kind of thought. 10.1% debt to GDP ratio. Real growth is basically nothing. And, uh, well, 0.393 is not bad. 0.19 GDP surplus. Or just surplus in general. Resources cut off. Oh boy. Yeah, that sucks. The resources we have acquired from Germany will be cut off. Or will, will be gone. Oh crap. Kick the hornet's nest. Build a stockpile. Which I read earlier, but whatever. Oh, that sucks. That really does suck quite a bit. We're not even making any more soldiers. Which also does suck. Into Africa. Uh, interesting. Very interesting. Warsaw Uprising. Alright, not bad. We do planes. Yeah, we don't. The Africa Shield. To see that things in North Africa are moving quickly would be an understatement. Officials in Quillemaine are worrying with. Working without sleep, racing between the government buildings and military barracks. With the death of Hitler and the dawn of a fratricidal slaughter home. Lines of communication and supplies have been precarious at best. Every hallway smells of military cigarettes. And the countless office fans are working even harder than any clerk or messenger. And in the middle of it all, like the trunk among a million twisting roots, is Hans Hutig. He stands over his desk looking at scrawled memento memos, outdated frontier maps, and stained ledgers, all the detritus of an empire in crisis. Quietly, he opens up one of his filing cabinets and pulls out a slim folder. Word along the top in black small small black lettering is Not Far Line Zatzplan, Africa Shield. He looks over and takes a breath. Well this was this, this is what must be done. He goes back to his desk and picks up the phone. Put me through the windhook and Leopoldville. Oh my apologies, my I had a burp or something. No, don't lose all the stuff. No. They were doing so well. Hidden heroes. Which I think we play as uh, England again sometime. Kicking the hornet's nest. A darkened room somewhere in South Africa. The orange rays of afternoon slither in between the Venetian blinds. A thin, lean man with oily, sandy blonde hair stands before a corkboard, puffing at a cigarette. The smoke rising to be whirled around the room by a violently rotating ceiling fan. The man cocks his head as he regards the corkboard outside of the sounds of late afternoon traffic. But the man does not hear them, focus as he is on the intricacy of his design. A dozen or so black and white photographs, many of them taken from furlative angles, crowd the corkboard. White strings wrapped, wrapped around the pins of each photograph connects them to each other. One photograph in the center of the corkboard is connected to all the others. It is subject to a middle-aged man with a pale, craggy face facing towards the camera. 
The smoker finished his cigarette and lit another. He moved closer to the cork board, absorbed by the central photograph. The man's name, written on the photograph in black marker, was Ian Smith, a former British colonist from Zimbabwe who escaped in South Africa after the Reich had taken over. After building himself a new farm in Weiburg, Smith had vocally criticized Reichskommissar Hutig and the new regime and had become a prominent advocate for the rights of the British colonists and exiles still in Ost Africa. In other words, he had become a nuisance. Unrolling the string and pinning the photograph, the smoker slipped it into his jacket pocket. So, the Reichskommissar wanted to destabilize South Africa with a political assassination, or did he? Well, what better way to achieve that than to assassinate one of the most publicly outspoken Anglos and pin it on the boards? He picked up the telephone, dialing his handler in Quillamane, and in doing so knocked down the first domino that would send South Africa spiraling into anarchy. How many powers of darkness claimed him for their own? Hmm. Oh, and there they go, my friends. We can still have booby traps, but we should be okay without doing that. Failed operation. It was past midnight. Deeply ensconced in his favorite armchair, Hutig slipped, sipped at a glass of cognac, ignoring the murmuring chatter around him. His most important subordinates were gathered at a drink, smoking away at the phone call they knew was coming, nursing his glass, and beginning to feel slightly tipsy. Hutig slowly looked around the room. Bea and Chemilski were there, as was for Mengel for once. He took a few deep breaths, trying to get back under control. Perhaps he thought this ought to be his last drink. He mustn't disgrace himself in front of everybody. That's shrill. Ringing in the telephone put a sudden end to his underlings prattle when Hutuk made no move. They asked stepped forward and picked up the receiver. Well, he stood there for a while, listening and growing more and more puzzled. Ah, oh, yeah, yeah, Danka. Hanging up. They all turned to the gathered dignitaries and announced with utter bewilderment that the operation had failed and with the Ost African assassins being unable to find Smith and yet somehow Smith had still been killed. Still staring into the middle distance, Hutuk heard his underlings debate what could have possibly happened, eventually deciding he must have been the bulls having the same idea. Realizing the men were all looking to him, expecting him to say a few words, Hutuk sat down the empty glass and stood. Thankfully, he didn't stumble or sway. Men, today we triumph once more. Though our bullet wasn't astray, it was clear that the Judeo degenerate state of South Africa still needs a little encouragement to collapse from the rot with him. Long live national daddyism, and long live the daddy. Was he slurring? He couldn't tell. He felt a moment of trepidation as he looked into Bear and Chemilski's eyes. Could they tell? Although they still looked utterly baffled at this turn of events, his men seemed emboldened, feeling drowsy and embarrassed, Hutig sank once more into his armchair. So, Ian Smith was dead. That ought to shake the decaying decadence of South Africa up a bit, but for some reason he found it tickled, difficult to care about it right this minute. His vision seemed to swim before him. Could the others tell he'd let himself get drunk? Surely not, surely not. Besides, there, this was a once-off. A celebration. It wasn't a violation of spot and discipline. It was all right to drink a bit more on occasions such as these, wasn't it? His face was like the autumn sky, overcast one moment and bright the very, very next. Oh, go, 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 go. Boar supports staff return home. Bows Olive and Bagahona underway. That call goes out over an isolated radio frequency. Bouncing from some Beziach to Lawrence Marcos to Quillamane, carefully encoded so as to alert the South Africans. When the Rex comes out, gets a message, he smiles, for he knows its meaning. Two groups of surplus, Hanamog. Carriers are departing from isolated jungle training camps, heading for the border. Aboard them are dozens of South African boars. They're ragged and tired from the hard training, but also confident in their newfound skills for the boars. There's a chance to defend their families, homes, and heritage. As for us, and for all South Africa, it's another dagger in Cape Town's side. When the transport reaches the border, the German officers and board trainees wave goodbye to one another. They've grown friendly over the long spent weeks on the off African frontier. Then they shoot their local smugglers and dump their bodies in a nearby river. Can't be too careful. Our nods are sharpened, my friends. And we are ready. Ian Sh Smith shot in Vryborg. Actually, we have no focus here, huh? We're still building a stockpile. Nice. Hutig sat motionless behind his desk, staring at the ceiling as he had been for some time, working at one o'clock in the afternoon with a churning stomach and a bad case of cotton mouth. He had stumbled to his office, and when he found that attempting anything resembling a thought gave him the sensation of a pair of ice picks being forced through his eyes, the Reichskommissar had decided to spend some time recovering his faculty. So this was a real hangover. It bore little resemblance to those of his pathetic little headaches he used to get as a boy when he finished a few... Uh, flilched a few of his father's beers, which he now realized were a dim shadow of the real thing, groaning. He leaned forward to stare at his desk. He was stacked high with paperwork, missives, reports, memos, orders, telegraphs, letters, requests, demands, transcripts, bulletins, dispatches, and tidings fair and ill had, that had accumulated since the prior afternoon. Wanting nothing more than to dive over the palace balcony to, to the gravel below, the thought of answering them must lust the horrific prospect of having to categorize them. He found his eyes drawn to the morning newspaper, sparking the tantalizing headline, Ian Smith shot in Vryborg. Though every sound his body screamed at him, Hutig watched himself pick the newspaper up and began to read. His stomach swirled like a whirlpool as he attempted to digest what the newspaper was telling him oddly. Almost all the details on Ian Smith's death was mentioned in the article were different from those he'd been given by his intelligence officers at the party the evening before. Were his men so incompetent they couldn't get the correct intel and own operation? Or had someone else gotten to Smith before they could and they'd been taken credit for it, either mistakenly or intentionally, in the hope of increasing their prestige on the backs of the real assassins? If his suspicions were correct and Smith had been taken out by a third party, then it appeared to prove that South Africa's spiral into the best was happily progressing 
on its own didn't need the extra push. At least that's what he would have thought, had he been capable of cognition. With only a few neurons firing haphazardly, he leaned back in his chair that felt that familiar creak deep in his bones and teeth clenched, resolved to never drink again. Of course, he had a glass of cognac in his hand within an hour. The wilderness burst into a peal of laughter that would shake the fixed stars in their places. If anything, I want to blitz through here. I remember I did this last time too, to blitz through here and just cut them all off. That would be really good. But yeah, we'll see what happens. Screw more workers? Yes, please. The time is now, normally. At a moment like this, Hans Hutig would be fairly deep into a stupor. He spends most of his nights like that, doling the waves of fury and annoyance that constantly ripple through his mind, but not tonight. Tonight, he is sitting in a command center, beneath Quillamate at the head of a crowded table. His officers are bickering about which battalion has been sent where. What squadrons are most vital for interdiction? Whose plans to save the race or doom the nation? Aides in the... Aides a man, the phone that line the walls, sending coded messages out into the fields. Everyone knows what they're here for. The boards have taken up arms, declaring a new great truck, and the South African blacks have attempted to throw off Cape Town's chains. All three will fall tonight. All South African allies will go to war. All eyes slowly turn to Hutig. He allows himself to savor the moment of mastery from here. All the chaos and bloodshed and misery to come is just an arrangement of markings on a map, and he will control it all. In which we shall begin and hopefully win this war pretty quickly, even though we probably don't want to. If I remember the last time, we need to be relatively uh, slow-ish. Yeah, you guys go there. We don't want to win too fast, because we want to make sure we get max devastation. Oh, hello. Oh, would you look at that? Okay, well, whatever. Everyone else hold. Hold. I want you all go this way. Go. There you go. After shields intervenes, yes please, and... Now it begins. With the first opening shots, the state of war has officially begun between the Africa Shield in South Africa and the Americana Puppeteers. Exactly like 20 years ago, the proud Aryans faced once more an overwhelmingly superior enemy with no other weapon than our superior will. And exactly like 20 years ago, we should prove to these fools of the superiority of the master race. Mobilize the forces to the last man. Bring forth the panzers, bring forth the bombers and the cannons. Fulfill and Vatalan. Vel Vidden Sigurik Sign. Jumps of war, nice. We gotta make sure this war stays steady. Also, a couple comments included us. Uh, I talk fast. Yes, I do. Yes, I do. Uh, the economy tab in Tierno gives someone a headache. Yeah. Strangeheim. Uh, do a less depressing campaign after this one. Uh, someone says, who takes Africa as uh, damnation, not salvation? Uh, someone says, are we going to do the South African war on hard mode? Probably not for this campaign, as we as we can tell right now. Maybe next time. And someone, a couple people actually ask if I can do Long Yun or Yunnan China. And Tierno when? Or Japan. Eventually. I can tell you that. Social program cost factor. Ooh. More bonuses. I like that, but less cost. Our duty is clear. Our path is set from Germania to the deepest recesses of the jungle. We shall hold together. Hold high the name of Balatalan. However, our enemies are many, and our forces few. If we want to prevail, we need to fully mobilize our forces, both economically and militarily. Conscription shall be enacted throughout the Rex Commissar in order to bring about all of our reserves, and our factories will run at full capacity. Also, Africa will be the bombardment of German will. A single steel-like entity fully tends towards victory like a fiery puma hunting its prey. Let our enemies fear us. We can do war taxes. Growth goes down, which is not very good. Eh, we're kind of okay already. With what we got here, I think we'll be okay. Mahon. Yes. Keep him in place. Everyone do that. First, that's fine with me too. We move fast enough. And have they been cut off? Yes, they have. Good. Nice. Good job, guys. Honestly, like with this group here. Let's focus up here. And then just don't move too fast. A little bit of lag, but that's okay. We'll see what happens. Yeah, they are losing pretty quickly. Yeah, it's not bad. Now it begins. There you go. Now it begins. Rex comes out hooted. Strutted into the meeting hall. Within the a Grand War planning station had been established. All around him, officers in uniform walked to end and fro with a true sense of urgency, communicating points of updated information or passing off newly minted documents. Despite the nerves that lingered within him, Hutu could almost bounce with excitement. This was his element. It, it was showtime. Rex Commissar proceeded to the grand table in the center of this converted meeting hall, upon which a large and impressively detailed map sat. Speckled with different icons representing the locals, locations of Ost African forces in the field. A posse of generals stood rigidly at attention around the map and snapped to a salute to Hutig as he approached. Hutig swiftly gave a sharp salute in return as they all stood at ease and got to the business of the day, the business of warfare. Gentlemen, let us not waste any time with the officialities or pleasantries today. We have a war to fight, Hutig began, wasting not one moment to arrive in in arriving to his point. Currently, where do we stand? What are our vulnerabilities and where? He finished, staring at his generals as they looked to one another for an answer, following such an unexpectedly rapid commencement of business. The Zambezi River. Sir, piped up an old general lieutenant. 
We have token forces ready to respond to a crossing, but if the South Africans arrive in force, they may break through. Wutig waved his hand dismissively at the general. They will be throwing themselves into a waste of forests and savages. If that's what they wish to expend their forces conquering, then so be it, he retorted. The Boers have the South Africans nicely preoccupied at the moment. I want to know where we can attack. Several of the generals in the room murmured amongst one another unexpectedly, as if they never conceived the notion that their superior would have wished to order an attack three minutes into the first meeting of the war. As Wutig began to deliver an icy vex stare at his generals, a group of Führer quickly piped in. The SS divisions of Abant and Jäger stand ready for any operation, sir. You only need to say where and when. Hutig smiled at the response. Then let it be so, he replied jovially. Pointing at the South African coast upon the map, he finished his set of orders. They won't see a single moment of rest against us, not one. They will relearn the meaning of Blitzkrieg. Cry havoc and let the, slip the dogs of war. Well, we're trying to Blitzkrieg right now, but that's okay. Um, mobilize, skim the milk. Hmm, miscellaneous income for 90 days. Cut all unnecessary funding and redistribute those funds to the war effort. The shield united. As the main proponent of the Africa Shield, it's also Africa's duty to coordinate the joint war effort of the German Rex Commissariats in the Dark Continent. Divided we are weak, but united, no one will stand together against the combined might. Let's try and forget about the past grievances and fight together against a common enemy, Aryan Brothers, all across Africa. Answer this call. Für Führer and Vaterland, last uns gegen den Feind wer einen. We honestly might win this one way too quickly. Hmm. Point one two, not bad. Not bad, my friends. Yeah, we just cannot win this too quickly, because we are... Jesus Christ, we are pushing it fast and hard. I mean, obviously the Americans are going to get involved, too, but let's kill off these uh, African National Congress. Which, I, I don't mind playing them sometime, but they have no frequency yet, so we're not going to. Not anytime soon. I still play... He still plays awesome sometime, too. They sound like fun. Losses? 145 versus 70,000! Not enough dead Africans! Beautiful, my friends. I go there. You guys go there too. There you go. There you go. Completely surrounded. Almost a million manpower. Now is the offense getting involved? Oh, we're mobilizing more. That's nice. Point one seven. Not bad. They go in. We kill them off. Simple as that. Still nowhere to run. Ah, goodbye. Ah, the Americans have sent divisions already. Oh boy. Now there's no helicopter division, so it should be a little bit easier, right? Right. Those guys are taking this. Oh. Oh, you're going to see this one. No, I think we're okay. I'm pretty okay without seeing that stuff. Hmm. More military factories or civvies? Honestly, probably millies. Let's go there, and then we'll do that one too. Oh. That was fast. That goes Himmler. We'll be trapped the border. We can still do that. Increase traps on Lorenz Marcus in Namabe. I don't really need to do that. I'm going to save the political power for now because I think we're going to need it, right? I'm pretty sure we're going to need that later on, so. It's fine if we hold on to it for now. Just want to get rid of the Africans first. <laughs> we always want to get rid of Africans. There, okay, we got rid of the Africans. And our goal is just to hold. Hold, hold the line. Well, maybe not that much of a line. There you go. And if we have supply issues, then we'll maybe put logistic companies maybe on them if we can. Because we want to, if I remember correctly, we want to save this for as much as possible. Like, save as much political power, save the war, don't lose too fast, don't lose too slowly. You know, oh, obviously we don't lose at all, but still. The American tanks, oh boy. Oh wow, look at that lag. That is some serious lag. Can't pierce them all. Do we have any anti tank at all? No, we do not. Okay, game. Oh. Someone dying up there, maybe? Keep learning, keep learning. That's why we have it here. Let them get a ton of attrition here. Tons and tons of attrition. Their divisions are quite strong, to be honest with you. Look at that, it went str it spiked. Nice. Just hold the line. That's all. We, that's literally all I care about. Let it last for as long as you need to. The last sighting. A stormy night in the South Atlantic. A Sudan West Africa patrol boat monitoring the way the waters off the coast of Alexander Bay is periodically hit by waves from the bow, washing over the vessel. In the light of the thunderstrike, one of the crews spots something and motions to the captain. The sighting is confirmed to his horror. He starts relaying an emergency message to the Kriegsmarine command in. 
uh, Lutherans, many vessels, various types, marking zone, no. He tries to give off as much info as he is able to until a broadside of a Mark 42 guns ends his broadcast permanently. The report, though brief and vague, sets off a scramble across Africa. As a massive effort to confirm the report is undertaken, eventually. An aerial reconnaissance flight returns with pictures that send an enormous wave of dread throughout the entire shield. There can be no doubting it now, the Americans have arrived with a sixth fleet. Oh boy. Gone is any semblance of German naval superiority. Shattered are any dreams of ending the war through quick and daring naval invasion of the Cape. The seas belong to the cruisers and frigates of the American Navy as it skies through the flights. It skies through the flights of aircraft lined with the decks of the carriers. The fleet is of such a size that no one would dream of taking it on with the white ships of the shield. In one stroke, it appears Americans have achieved victory at sea for the South African War, but their war will be won on land. That looks bad, but we'll be okay. We'll be fine. Supply the Boers. The drums of war beat ever louder. Defense Industry Development. Assessor Industries. Generals. Uh, oh, Land Auction. I like that one. What's that one next? Unlike us, the other ex-commissars have mainly neglected keeping an efficient general staff. As a result, their forces are lagging behind and finding it difficult to coordinate laying across long distances, with their generals unable to properly lead units distant hundreds of miles from the command tents. While there will be ample time to talk about this shameful behavior when war is won, then we will not forget to remind our brothers of that. There are more urgent matters to attend to, and for now we shall send aides with enough support and equipment and personnel to help the other generals to better coordinate the war effort. Oh, that's it from Muti. The letter was written in a shaky cursive, that kind of an old woman, of course. My dear boy, Walt, I must admit the house seems empty without your laughter or your stomp. Oh, Walt, it sounds silly, but sometimes I hear it. Trampling in through the front door, those big boots of yours, you'd make the carpet all muddy and I'd spend the whole afternoon cleaning your mess. I'd have so much time now without your bed or rug or dishes to clean, so I picked up the hobby of knitting. I tell you, this winter will be cold. I felt it in the fall chill this morning. I made a nice cap for Stefan and I. You can have one as soon as you get back. You need it. Germany will feel like the North Pole after being in all that jungle. Some of the girls in the Women's League are quite good, and my mother used to knit all the way into the night before the war, of course. Hope you'll be back soon. All is well in Africa, I suppose. The fatherland is welcoming as ever. Your endlessly loving mother, Gertrude. A tear rolled down Walter's cheek. Not a single letter had made it into Africa since the first shots rang in Berlin. But now the first mail plane in a year had touched down in Vinhook, and with it the stories of tens of thousands of mothers before the great horror erupted back home, before the Burger Krieg upended life in totality. Germany sounds broken. Ah, we need more workers, please. Those American tanks, they just keep trying, man. They just keep going. This is really good for paying off our debt. I like it. You guys actually went down here too. Maybe not. I mean, obviously we don't have ASP already, but still. Eventually they will do a lot more general attacks, but I don't see if we can actually do anything here. Come on, get in there, get in there. Mm. Maybe? Just, just one. Just one tile. That's all I want. Just one tile. Yeah, maybe. All I want is a single tile. Army reserve training. Oh, can we actually get in there in time? Yes, yes, no, yes, yes, we did. Good job, guys. The shield united. Supply the boys, skim the cream, assess the generals. Yes, we have to. Where's the. Oh, drums of war. Surrounded by degeneracy. You bet we are. Oh, we get more attack. That's nice. Oh, hello. They need more attrition. We can't pierce them, but they can pierce us. Unfortunate. We got a lot of peepee, though. But like I said, gotta keep it. We're putting more roads, which is nice. Let's population growth. Research speed. Prisons. Oh, we could probably honestly use another army base in Kachukau. There it is. Army base. There you go. How are we doing down here? Doing okay over there? Nice. Uh, don't attack too much. We just need to make sure we get more equipment. That's a general thing. We're making some tanks. We're making, stuff. We're making a little bit of everything. That's not bad. Not bad. Nice. Good stuff. Except planes. My gosh. Do we need planes? Or what? It's just the generals. Industries. All come out of Africa. Oh, that's not bad. More organizations are actually very good too. Shanks Jets. Soldiers of Fortune. Or we get more infrastructure as well. So Sanzibar, huh? Infrastructure is nice. Skim the milk. Let's do that one next. The demands of war are increasingly our need for funds. 
Oh, increasing it. Funds that we don't have. As our colonial budget is already stretched to the fullest, still we must win this war. So we'll have to make some cuts, skim some cream. There are so many useless things we're doing before the war began, such as funding schools, hospitals, and even tolerating the natives. It's time to stop being sentimental and divert all resources towards the war effort. Those who depend on these subsidies will find another way, or they will be un unwanted but necessary sacrifice on the altar of victory. The of the land demands it. The flaws with the Fliegerfaust. For Oberkommando Africa, subject Fliegerfaust performance, classification for Oberkommando only. Uh, body 1. Combat reports from South Africa show mixed results for the Fliegerfaust application in battlefield conditions. 2. Its rocket salvo is useless against fast moving jet aircraft due to the absence of a guidance system. Moreover, uh, forcing operators to lead their targets, its performance drastically decreases at ranges beyond 500 meters. This limits its use to low flying close air support aircraft. These combined make the Fliegerfaust an extremely deficient man pad. 3. However, the Fliegerfaust has performed exceptionally well against helicopters. The low airspeed and low uh, flight altitude fall within the weapon's system ideals operating conditions. Units engage against American air assault elements in particular hold the Fliegerfaust in high regard due to the relative ease with which they dispatch ingressing Bell UH 1 Huey gunships during heavy engagements. 4. Ovia. We recommend procurement or development of long-range man pads against fast-moving American ass air assets, while adjusting infantry unit organization to relegate the Fliegerfaust as an anti-helicopter support weapon at the company level. Truncated for brevity. Report end. Do not lose it, my friends. Those American tanks will be whittled down to nothing. 0.28, nice. It went straight up, and then kind of went down. 6.3, nice. We could do this. Honestly, once we get here fast enough, I'm probably, I might raise army expenditures. But I might just do a ta temp tax cut as well. We'll see. Bichon. Ah, the Australians. It's Aussies. Ah, yes. The West African War. Africa bleeds as it should. Can you guys actually win here, maybe? Maybe? Nine thousand, twenty-five thousand. Oh. If you lose a single tile, that's fine. Just do not damage our own equipment too much. That's much more important. Ooh, esoteric Nazism versus the wretched, uh, with the wretched bear. Who take under national daddyism? We love national daddyism. Um, can I actually take this tile, maybe? There's only one division here. Three v one. You might be able to win. They can't pierce us yet too much. Kyle Chmielski. He's really good on attack, though. That's what we like. More factory output? Yes, please. Because, my God, do we need it. <laughs> hey, good job, guys. Chabong. We got it. Nice. Ooh, attrition. Yes. Uh, kind word in a gun. Two men place their uh, guns on the blanket of ground with all the care reserved for their prized possessions, and since they were. Now, Eddie. <clears throat> oh, Friedrich said, tone childing as a kindergarten teacher. He has swept a hand along his NFLAG. See this butte? Finest service rifle in history. Shoot 20 fannings in a row at 800 yards. No more moving parts than necessary. Harder than diamonds than Herr Schwanzi. Field trip it in your sleep and it fires the next morning like it hadn't left the factory a day ago. Who wouldn't want to swap their scrap metal with it straight away? Yeah, it's a good gun, I guess, murdered, muttered Eddie, but we had to make do when the ba blacks were at our door back in Salisbury. And the smelly, uh, <clears throat> Edward gestured as Lee Enfield. Gets a job done, done, done well. None of your fancy gas operator BS. Heck, I know some smells with shore in the barrel just like that. His hand chopped, uh, chopped at the rifle's midpoint. Then you got yourself a boomstick for the jungle. Three just rolled his eyes. My making do with scraps still making do with scrap. Feeling proud you own one yet? But you guys know what's appeared, though, Hendrik, uh, one of the younger Belgian missionaries said as he started over. What's that? The two polemicists asked. The M14. Laughter all around the campfire. You got that right, son. Feels weird reading that. It does feel very weird. 0.3 billion. God, war is profitable. No wonder we always try to engage in it. Feeling pretty good, yeah. Says so, so, stupid generals. Skim the cream, because we love cream here. Hmm. Yes, keep trying, keep trying, Americanos. Oh, we'll fit members. Huh. Conscript the tribes? Mm hmm. Unified holdouts. Nice cup of tea. Despite Africa's judgmental humidity, SS Hop of Shafir, Bautzaha, Shot. So gleefully slips a cup of coffee or tea, really, on a bench outside the Sambeasha barracks. Also, Africa's austere place. Also, African SS and austere organization. But Balthasar still endeavors to make time for this one comfort. His eyes close and the tea washes across his tongue, rich, dark, malty, magnificent, but not quite. He still has in reverence, the flavor offering some slight absolution in his dawn backwater. Balthasar loves his tea. It reminds him of home. Back in Edmund. Edmund, 
Muti would serve it again in Thurn Porcelain Cups, not the steel mugs the troops here issued. Uh, try as it might, Baltsaha can never find Klunja. So he may do with the pouring ration sugar at the bottom of his mug, not as sweet as his tongue would call, but it was better than nothing. Hardly any cream in Sambiash either, so. His imitation tea also had none of the thin white Wilkja, hovering just below the rim. Always compromises for the Reich in Africa, tea, tea deed was no less exempt. Sometimes he wonders why he had ever left. He already made decent money as a factory guard back home, but then he had seen those posters, read those magazine articles, and then the recruiter had come to know how perfectly Aryan his eyes were. Perhaps he would be something more in Ostafrica, Africa, he thought. Then he remembered. Captives screaming, forests burning, soldiers screaming, and men trampling villages as they relished in atrocity, women and screaming. Baltaha took another sip of Essatz, Ostfreisen tea. The amber did little to wash the memories away. Come, have some tea and talk of happier things. Yes. Pipeline, assistor industries, why not? To say that the industrial development across Central Africa and Sudwest Africa is disappointing is an understatement. The ill nourished factories can barely supply the garrison as they are. It's a miracle that they even have enough ammo to shoot. This is becoming increasingly frustrating, but the need of the war are more important, so we shall send economic advisors to our brothers to help them in the, ac the arcane art of actually making a dawn factory work. Barbarossa, huh? Yeah, we'll take the great patriotic war for now. Yeah, totally. Ah, uh, win, soldiers, win. Fight. Oh, cool in Paraguay. What's going on over there? Ghana has been destroyed by Ghana. Stratocratic Nazism, a little cadillo. Flip and dialogue. Very cool. Who's winning up here? Goring, it looks like he's losing to Borman. Borman looks like he's doing really well, but this is way too early to tell. Hmm, sucks. Attempt A. Glezio Siano. Zion. Wow, this looks like a giant mess. No Sibirsk, huh? Pavada. Ooh, better artillery, yes please. Even more artillery, yes. Yes. Oh, hello, are we losing here? Oh, that sucks, bro. Don't be losing, son. Don't be losing. Losing ain't cool. Cool in Scotland? Oh, oh. Goodbye, Scotland. Can you guys actually just win here too? Maybe? Maybe not. Yeah, maybe not. Are those mountains? I don't know those mountains. Okay, it is mountains. Oh. No? Yes, no? Bombs over with dudes. The engine rudder sputter brought Rudolph back to reality as he struck the darn thing side with his fists. Effing rubbish, he growled. The cockpit seat made guiding the shaking plane through the runway an insufferable chore. But luck favored him for once in his life, and the plane finally climbed upwards. Ha <laughs> ha, finally, Rudolph cheered. His hands on the yoke tightened as he drew a deep breath. Today's assignment was a bombing run. He hoped that it wouldn't pass out from the heat struck long before he reached his destination. There was plenty of ground to cover and plenty of targets to match, so his trip will last for quite a while longer. The sun was already beginning to set when it first flew past Orange. He wasn't worried about the anti-aircraft fire, considering the bloody Africans were hardly prepared for war against a German machine. At least that's what he hoped for, and that's what he was paid for. He glanced from his cockpit to the ground below, spotting several settlements scattered about with only a few gravel roads in between. One of them, however, seemed to light up in a way that struck him as odd. With the reflexes of a bomber pilot, Rudolph turned to the yoke and grinned. American idiots who muttered under his breath, sorry to say, but I do believe Rudolph has found you. Now if you can just come out of your little hidey holes. With the proper timing and a button press, the plane rose slightly upward as parts of his payload flew down to the village. Nodding to himself, Rudolph steered the plane back towards its destination. He smiled when he heard that oh-so-familiar whistle. He didn't receive a full reconnaissance support of this area, true, but he had already done the deed. He was sure the village was up in, ca in chaos and shrieking flame after its light was doused. Perhaps there weren't any Americans there, but it was their fault for deciding to stick out like a sore thumb in this war. Oh well, less Africans to deal with either way. Oh, it was a good day. Yeah, we gotta help them out next. Point three four billion, nice. And we're still growing. Ah, national socialist economics are the best type of economics. There we go. Oba Commando Africa, yes. Just as our homeland, we need a central general staff to coordinate the war effort on an even higher level. With the Oberkommando der Afrikanischen Streitkräfte, we shall be allowed, no, I shall be allowed, to give orders directly to all shield troops, no matter what Rex Commissar they belong to, dramatically increasing cohesion between units and overall tactical and strategic effectiveness and coordination. Even more importantly, this is the best chance we will have at turning the mess of, of the mess of disseberated we call allies into something actually resembling a proper fighting force. Independence. And, and, totally, what, what? Independence in Anatolia. The Empire is dissolved once again. I don't think I've seen this one yet. Hello, what is this? Moving. 65, huh? 
Oh, just Republican tricky, huh? Well, well left wing populism, huh? Wow. Economic stagnation. Good job. And what are they? Left wing populist. Oh, social democracy. Okay. Well, huh. Odd, but okay. Why not? Go along with it for now. 0.7 billion. Seven, uh, 0.78 percent. Did you mean not billion? Huh. Um, debt is just 0.238. Not bad. Oh, can we advance anywhere else? Session. Uh, tricky dick goes bye bye. Yeah, no, you can't win the war this time. Might have to wait till the next guy shows up. Slowly, we'll just keep pushing in into little areas that are easy to beat. Art of the Atrocity. Second Lieutenant Redford led his platoon through the Congo jungles, and one of the new routes brass is drawn up. Compared to the typical crop firefighter or some other uh, F off assignments they were given, this was a dream for him and his men. All he needed now was a show of force from the boys to prove that they were top when it came to courage. Rudolph raised a fist, and jungle leaves ceased, rustling as a trailing man halted. Cracks in the air, crackles in the air, maybe a campfire in the clearing. One private peered out past the brush with his scope. Hancock, what do you see, he asked. Three tangos, LT, returned Hancock. One standing, two sleeping, some sort of camp. Effing marks, careless as always. Splatoon, on my go. The soldiers hurried positions around the campfire in one, two, three seconds. Gunfire lit up the camp, bullets flying, not a single shot returned. Redford smiled at the clean work. Bingo, he said, let's move. The platoon rushed forward and emerged through the brush. The tango who dropped dead wore a mark patch, just as Redford expected. What we didn't expect were the dog tags, American dog tags, wrapped around the sleeping tango's eye eyeless skulls, and the handless wrists eking blood into the undergrowth. Redford swiveled around, catching sight of a corpse with bloody stumps for legs. One roasting by the fire, the other jabbed toe first into his gab, and Gus played onto the campground from a crosswise cut. When him, someone, maybe Hancock's wretched little lunch shop. Man, can't blame him. This camp just saw a war crime happen. These were our boys, sir, Private Boggard near sobbed from his side. The lieutenant signaled to the radio man die when he smelled a rotten stench wafting from a tarp by the shack. A worm of flies rage above its length. Effing dirty dudes. I keep going back here because it says seven, but we don't need to add any more traps. We're, we're doing pretty darn well here, so no, no traps actually needed. Good. Do we win here too? Maybe, maybe not. Yeah, just slowly winning. Uh-oh. Well. Spear's gone. Which is fine with us, actually. That, that should be fine with us, yeah. Not bad. So it's just the industries. No, but come out of Africa will be very good as well. Just pay off that debt. Pay off that debt. That's all I care about right now. Let's pay off the debt now, then we can get more money later and spend it on the people. Not bad, not bad. Oh, he wins in Austin. He usually seems to win in Austin, it seems like. Anywhere else? No, no. Down here, no mountains. Very mountainous down here. Unfortunately. Very, very, very mountainous. Once the division leaves, we will probably attack here too. Supplies are quite bad though. Mm. If needed, we're going to shift this around a little bit more. Um, supply wise, it's very bad in the center. So I want you guys. Actually, let's go back here. You guys just guard generally just the entire front line. I want you all to be like near the top here. There we go. Break it up just a little bit more. Protection inks, jets. Pay me as men. Thus, the division organization better recovery rate, or support, and hot acclimatization factor. Development triad. It's not bad. Simplify arms production. Um, that seems okay. Unified holdouts. Highly decreases military training. Eh. I like pipeline of Zanzibar, though. But well, let's do supply the boards first. Our boar friends are brave and loyal to the cause, but they lack most basic supplies, from medical equipment to modern artillery, since they are our first line against Americana. We need to ensure they can fight effectively and resist until our larger reinforcements can leave the front. Trains and truck convoys will depart immediately for the Rhodesia and deliver them wherever might whatever uh, might be useful to them. For the sake of victory, let's hope they aren't bombed on the road. 3.9%? Nice. Right, so is that, will that help out quite a bit more? It should, at least. In theory. Hopefully we can attack this area here. These tanks just keep attacking and attacking and attacking. Which is fine with us, but still. 0 0.208, not bad. What are we building up now? Army base still? Taking a while for that one. Are we, do we have any... Oh, it's looking a little better here. No, that's actually looking a lot worse than it was earlier. Uh, equipment. 
Yeah, we need more equipment, man. Could really use better equipment. Can you guys actually go in here and win, maybe? Yes, no, maybe so. Not bad. Not bad. Hmm. Just depends how long these guys want to fight down here. That's all it really depends upon. Just keep building, keep building, keep building, keep producing, keep producing. We need way more anti tank, though. And motorized. And main battle tanks. And planes. Actually, getting any sort of planes would be very helpful. Oh, we'll come out to Africa. Very good. Whew, these Canadian tanks, man. Service. A missile vast hell hellscape of degeneracy and barbarism. A bastion of civilization that once stood proud and firm. His name was Paul Jung, a model SS man, dutiful, skilled, and composed. Once commended by a superior as a testament to the courtesy and intelligence of the Aryan mind, those were simple times. Like Ozymandias before him, aged, slow, and weathered slowly weathered once great foundations. Each year she had brought a new fallen brother, a new nervous tick, a new assault onto the psyche. With all the fury he can muster, he waged a war against his cowardice, yet his efforts were in vain. Keeping fertility looked oppressed in the back of his mind, growing until it reached a fever pitch. All was lost, his brothers lie dead or missing, his father and torn apart, the Laban's realm fought so dearly four decades ago, buried by an unceasing, unceasing tides of humans, all, most of all. Paul himself was lost, the once towering Aryan specimen, reduced to a half-naked husk, muttering to himself among the weeds. Patrol passed above him. As headlights drawing long shadows across the dirt road, Paul fingered the grenade pin. The time was now. Degeneracy had seeped into his body, but not his mind and soul, and he will not and he will die in service to his people, his Reich and his fear long before it shall fall. With a wordless cry, the broken area rose up, will, the last of his race's innate fur to a forlorn hope. Three shots rang throughout the night, and the final collapse assured. Here lies a proud son of the Reich, and might makes right. Fed Weber Leon and his merry executioners, eh? The eponymous man, voice barely rising above the truck's engine rumbles. His driver companion shrugged, eyes glued to the road. Dunno, sir, sounds scary, yeah, but we're professionals too, aren't we? Merry executioners. Leon waved his hand and took a puff out of cigarette, executing or running a figure, finger around his forehead. See those three out the back, he asked, jerked, hugging a thumb behind his shoulder. With rope on their wrists and bags in their heads, two white and one black men sat on the back of the truck, flanked by two men carrying rifles and soldiers' garb. The driver nodded as Leon passed. Pat his back once. We'll show them both, son. Just follow my lead. While the simmering sea was beautiful, the truck sputtering flumes of smoke, and the captain shoved off the truck at a bayonet point. Wasn't. May I ask you boys a question, he asked. Uh, teeth grazing against a cigarette skin before he snuffed the used butt underfoot. They hiked towards the coast in silence. I see you don't speak your betters. Language. He shook his head. No matter. His English sounded like gargoyle seawater, but it suffice. I have a question, one another man. An American spoke up. Y yes? Why are you being why are you being led here? Leon asked with a pointed look and a sharp smile. I'm asking you why you are here, American. Well, he raised his voice, give me an answer. Fool, as a captive and his friend were forced on their knees near the water, he stammered to be shot. Leon let out a loud, exaggerated chuckle. Exactly. Ma, you are sharp on dementia. It's a shame you're not on our side, he snapped his fingers. In return to his precious German Thomas, Leonard Christian, ready arrivals, one the count of one, two on three. We shall send these men to the god. Now three, two, one, fire. Three gunshots swing out through the air. The smoke cleared, unveiled three men aiming rifles at three other men, knelt on the sand, water pooling by their knees. Wrapped in tremors, scared off their minds, but alive. Leon flicked his stare back to the driver, who stared back in surprise. Well, what, was that what you meant, sir? Yes. The fell day ball simply bared his teeth. Rats will always scurry away from the source of fear, soldier. And I think we'll end this episode with, after supplying the boars, develop boar industries. Boars for the Bolstadt. Take the prisoners. Ooh. Rigged a blow. Bulls for the Bullstadt. Can you truly consider yourself a boar if you hide in all Africa? No. It's a time for all boars who have chosen exile among us in the last years to leave the darkness and face the enemy for the good of their homeland. As they are most assert, mostly convinced national socialists and better trained than their fellow brothers in Rhodesia, these exiles will make finally troops and officers for the boar troops, further increasing our control over the faction. But if you enjoyed today's strong episode, leave a like, subscribe if you're new. Check out my Discord link in the description below. Tell me how much you love esoteric Nazism and all national socialism. And I will see you tomorrow, as we will might just win the South African War. Thanks for watching. Have a great rest of your day.